one of the reasons uh, why I am especially interested uh, in the issue of uh, culture is that uh, uh, when I started my studies, uh, one of the most important uh, issues I had to study was about legal culture. While, uh, of course, uh, when we study food governance, uh, we have, uh, and one of the main uh, uh, pillars of the study is about, is about food culture. And this is the reason why, especially in the last years, uh, my studies have been devoted to uh, somehow um, establish a dialogue between these two cultural elements. Uh, my presentation will be divided in four parts. The first one is about uh, the, um, uh, the relationship between food culture and legal culture and why uh, the legal and institutional factor should be taken into account when we talk about what food culture is uh, and also how food culture can be uh, used in studying food governance. The second one is uh, of, um, uh, food governance, especially at the global level and its cultural uh, roots. The third one relates uh, to a specific element uh, uh, which uh, I studied more in depth, uh, which is the labeling regulation as a cultural outcome. And the fourth one will be some conclusions uh, regarding what culture is, uh, what culture is not, and how it can be uh, used uh, properly in uh, studying uh, uh, food law and food policy solutions in the different uh, in the different systems. So. We can start by saying that uh, um, there are many different definitions uh, of food uh, cultures. Uh, Tim uh, reminded one of them. Uh, another one which I found is that it is a complex of practices, attitudes and beliefs, uh, as well as the networks and institutions surrounding the production, distribution and consumption of food. And uh, I, I like this definition basically because it also refers uh, to the institutional framework and also to the uh, policy making activity regarding production, distribution, distribution and consumption. While uh, on the other hand, uh, I, uh, um, I, I used one of the <laughs> few of the many different definitions of legal culture which uh, have been uh, proposed in the last decade. But we have to say that it is an unclear concept because, uh, first of all, because it refers both to something that the law expresses, uh, so something which is at the base of the law and which is the content of the law, but at the same time also something that law needs uh, to uh, address. In general, when we talk about legal, legal culture, we are referring to the history of law, the law itself, the content of the law, but also the institutional framework within which the law is adopted, is applied, and also, of course, the different subjects, outsiders and insiders, which uh, apply the law, which interpret the law, and which are affected uh, by the law. I think that uh, both definitions are important, but that culture in this sense should be and um, actually has been used more an, as an explanatory device uh, rather than uh, an object uh, of inquiry. And the reason is that, uh, first of all, is that we are part of it. And the fact that we are part of it is uh, makes uh, difficult to talk about it because we do not have the proper perspective. We are part of the object. 
And at the same time, the fact that uh, it is uh, always uh, developing as uh, um, uh, a twofold uh, interaction. On the one hand, the interaction between the different layers of governance, I would say, the layers of uh, lawmaking, in the sense that at least uh, there are um, uh, four, four layers of governance, the international one, the supranational one, the national one, and the regional and local one. And they are always interacting one with the other. And on the other hand, because it is the interaction between different actors, which uh, are, uh, I would say, institutions on the one hand, but also businesses on the others and uh, consumers uh, as a third uh, as a third pole. Uh, the culture has been used basically to characterize differences between systems. And usually it is used to talk about resistance. And this is not only uh, uh, something related to uh, the food sector, but it is this way in general. I remember exactly the same uh, uh, the same use uh, before studying uh, food governance. Uh, and, uh, but when we focus on food governance, we have to consider both of them. And they, I would say that in this regard, uh, it is difficult to distinguish between uh, uh, food culture and legal culture in the sense that they are so mixed and so intermingled that uh, it is not possible, in my opinion, to distinguish between them. Uh, it is clear that food governance has some cultural connotations and it has some, some cultural connotations also in uh, legal terms, because it is clear that when we talk about uh, um, legal solutions, they are uh, they cannot be considered without considering the regulatory uh, environment and the institutional context where they have been uh, passed, uh, applied, uh, interpreted, uh, and so on. So uh, we have uh, to consider what uh, have been called the legal tradition, uh, types of practices, uh, attitudes, uh, expectations, and ways of thinking, in the sense that uh, uh, this cultural element is immediately uh, influenced and shaped by all, uh, but by all these different uh, factors. So I consider culture basically as a methodological tool, which is usually uh, used to talk about similarities and differences of legal solutions in different legal systems. Uh, on the other hand, imitations among legal orders, resistance to homologation, and so on. Uh, I, my idea is that it is clear that uh, when we are talking about uh, uh, legal solutions uh, in the food sector, we have all, always to consider also the uh, the entire environmental, um, uh, cultural environment. Uh, so it is clear that we have to uh, take in consideration the fact that uh, uh, legal systems are also different one from the other, from the institutional point of view. They um, pertain to different legal families. Uh, there are uh, differences regarding sources of law, what is, what is the most important uh, source of law, what is the uh, role of case law, what are, to which extent they are uh, facilitating or, resistant, uh, or resisting to the uh, legal homologation, global legal homologation. And in this regard, we have to 
clearly consider the fact that uh, there are different layers, as I said before, um, uh, which should be always taken uh, into account. And on the other hand, we have different actors uh, with different stances, which are always uh, in a complex relationship, one with the other, which can uh, uh, be um, uh, of uh, coexistence, uh, of cooperation, on competition, and so on. And this is the starting point of my, uh, uh, my last research in this regard, which was basically a kind of comparison between food labeling regulation in the EU and in, uh, and in the US. As I, as I said, culture is um, uh, the outcome of um, uh, an interaction among uh, different players. On the one hand, it is clear that institutions uh, uh, influence legal culture in the sense that, for example, institutions can have uh, very different ideas regarding what uh, uh, food is and how food should be regulated. Because, for example, there are legal systems which consider it food as a, an eminently special item which need to be highly regulated and which should be regulated uh, um, uh, regarding uh, um, uh, different elements of the food system. Uh, it depends on the priorities of the institutions. Uh, we experimented in the European Union when the European institutions started uh, regulating food, uh, the, the problem was uh, basically food security, especially in the 50s. And then uh, in the decades uh, um, of um, uh, uh, priorities uh, uh, changed, uh, we had the uh, chapter of food safety, that of food quality. Nowadays, we are more in that of uh, nutrition and uh, food sustainability, and so on. On the other hand, institutions have to decide the extent to which coping with uh, consumers, consumer interests, consumer preferences, risk uh, perception, in the sense that also in this regard, consumers have different sensitivities regarding, regarding food. They are more skeptical towards some processes, uh, and more positive towards uh, some others, uh, and so on. And at the same time, for example, they have to decide, institutions have to decide, uh, especially in terms of nutrition, for example, if uh, uh, to which extent to have uh, uh, more paternalistic, uh, paternalistic measures. Uh, On the one, on the other hand, we have businesses. Uh, businesses uh, are, are eminently um, uh, cultural authorities. They have their own strategies, uh, and their strategies obviously interact uh, with uh, uh, institutional uh, institutional strategies regarding uh, uh, their. Uh, how to interact with institutions. There are many different ways uh, to interact with institutions. Lobbying, uh, filling the gaps, um, uh, try to uh, capture uh, institutional solutions uh, and so on. And at the same time, as we know very well, businesses are regulators themselves in the sense that in many areas, in many sectors, they pass uh, regulations which are very important regarding food safety, regarding sustainability, regarding consumer protection. So one of uh, the other elements is this uh, interaction between uh, the um, uh, private lawmaking uh, and the public lawmaking. And finally, there are consumers. 
consumers have an important role in this regard in the sense that usually consumers uh, uh, in, uh, express consumer preferences and usually uh, they influence businesses on the one hand, but also institutions. Uh, I am going to give some examples also in this regard. Culturally is very important regarding consumer rationality and also about the, the average consumer. Because, for example, in Europe, uh, European legislators uh, start from the point that an average consumer exists, which is, uh, and that uh, consumer is a rational uh, subject. Uh, this is a starting point which uh, in many cases should cases should be debatable and this is also the reason why in some cases uh, um, uh, legal solutions do not work very very well this is the case of food labeling for example uh, which uh, in many cases does not work properly and at the same time it is a tool to interpret label uh, this is the, um, uh, one of the, one example of it is territory. Territory as a quality attribute. Uh, there are, um, in my studies, uh, I used uh, these uh, um, factors to consider the differences in the EU in the US regarding the GMO labeling regulation. Uh, which uh, the legal solutions are traditionally different. Uh, in the last years, uh, there has been an approximation of the solutions in the EU and uh, in the US at the federal level. The country of origin labeling, uh, in this regard, it is also interesting the fact that within the European Union, there are different ideas um, in the sense that uh, some uh, member states uh, in Europe uh, uh, adopt an idea which is different from that which has been at the base of the of uh, the regulation 1169-2011 regarding uh, uh, the provision of information to food consumers uh, and also regarding uh, the different kinds of uh, nutritional traffic light. Uh, so my conclusions. First of all, I talked about labeling, but it is clear that labeling is only the tip of the iceberg, in the sense that it is possible to use culture uh, as a lens to consider also other differences between uh, uh, systems regarding food safety, regarding uh, uh, the risk management regarding the application of a precautionary principle in the food sector. Also regarding territory as a food quality attribute. Uh, if uh, we think about uh, the international debate regarding the um, uh, the proper use of uh, quality schemes such as PDOs and PGIs. Uh, another conclusion is about the circular patterns of interaction among food culture and econo economic, cognitive, uh, political, institutional, and social, uh, social variables. And also uh, culture to, uh, to talk about the discrepancies um, uh, which are based on cultural divergency. The, the, Tra tradition and artisanality, for example, as um, a quality attribute. Uh, this is not the same around the world. In some cases, uh, it can, uh, in, in some legal systems, it can also be considered not so reassuring in terms of food safety. And this is the reason why there are uh, different regulations around the world. Autonomy, autonomy and paterner, paternalism we have talked about in the sense that uh, the starting point uh, of the consumer protection is that consumer is uh, the weak party 
uh, in contractual relationships. But at the same time, consumer should be responsible of uh, its uh, own uh, uh, choices. It is uh, he's an adult. So it should uh, have the proper knowledge and the proper rationality. Uh, and this is very uh, a dichotomy which is very difficult to uh, to solve. Uh, the relationship between the precautionary principle and the cost benefit analysis, so to which extent the precautionary principle should be applied. At the same time, it is clear that, uh, uh, for example, uh, in the case uh, of the EU and the US, we can also consider many similarities. The fact that culture should not be overemphasized in the sense that uh, um, uh, it is not something uh, not only fixed, but it is not uh, it basically. Um, most of the divergences between the EU and the US are the consequence of political choices which have been made in the 80s or in the early 90s, not before. So it is not something fixed uh, uh, and especially old in this regard. So I think that food cultures are dynamic. They are the outcome of interaction. They are non-homogeneous. They cannot be. They, they cannot be identified as pertaining to uh, uh, legal systems which are uh, within the national borders. So they do not coincide with nation states or legal system. And at the same time, that in general, they are uh, misunderstood, they are misused. There is, um, especially regarding tradition, the term and the misuse of tradition, there are many examples of uh, reinvented traditions. So I think that they are, um, they are concepts uh, which should be used very uh, carefully because they underpin uh, stereotypes. Okay. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you so much, uh, Lorenzo. That was uh, that was really interesting. And we have um, two questions in the chat. Those very simple questions that we will probably have to scratch all our appointments for the rest of the week to properly respond. But we will try in a, in a couple of minutes. <laughs> And the the first one it's it's really interesting about the paternalism and, and autonomy and so the fact that uh, how how autonomous can we say that choices really are in these in this food environment with marketing influences strategies and and so on and how this reflects in in the in the strategies that we could adopt because one could say that we are not autonomous at all. This is the question. Yeah, yeah. That was, uh, if you can reflect on this, in uh, yeah, it's. Uh... I cannot answer this question because, for example, I cannot answer the question about transparency in the sense that I don't know what transparency is. A transparency is the t one of the typical concepts which are used when we talk about the the provision of information to consumers in the sense that we have to consider that we are always uh, in a uh, context where all these concepts should be considered in a, um, um, in a relative sense. In the sense that it is clear that it is very uh, it is not possible to say uh, once and for all what autonomy is, exactly as it is impossible to say what uh, uh, transparency is. So we are using also artificial concepts, which uh, uh, taken uh, uh, objectively 
um, are uh, something which is not very consistent and which is disappearing. I think that they should be considered more as um, a goal to be pursued. Uh, but at the same time, it is clear that uh, if we consider it uh, and more uh, and the and the more we study it, the it is clear that the the the, uh, uh, the extent to which we are autonomous and we are free in making our choices uh, uh, are especially especially limited. But this is not a. a, a a good reason not to to continue in our uh, in our activity in the sense that it is exactly because this uh, context is so imperfect that we have to uh, pursuing the goal of having a of uh, uh, providing new tools to go towards uh, uh, a better consumer protection. Uh, uh, a fair food governance and so on. Thank you so much. Uh, Anant, do you have a question? Uh, yeah, uh, are there any other questions? Again, uh, we can access Lorenzo all the time. Are there any other questions from folks? Yeah, or? there's a, a question on uh, whether um, you see food culture, so food cal do we see food cultures as an outcome or a driver of our food system behavior? And then from the definition, uh, um, I, that you you gave it, that this person will be inclined to see it as a determinant of our societal societal behavior rather than vice versa. I think that they are both actually. When I when I I, I started studying uh, food culture, I remembered one uh, uh, interesting book uh, regarding uh, tradition about the notion of tradition. Um, Patrick Glenn is a very famous uh, uh, comparative lawyer uh, who talked about uh, food tradition, uh, about legal tradition, and he said that tradition basically is uh, an heritage, it, it's some information. It, it is like the um, the brand tab, the piñata. In the sense that it is passed, it is something which is passed from generation to generation, but uh, and each generation has to break the piñata so that the content uh, falls uh, on the head of a generation, and the generation has to reassemble it for the for the next one, uh, and of course. Uh, uh, it is interesting because uh, this uh, activity of reassemblance of piñata will be with different uh, ingredients, uh, with a different interpretations of the different factors and so on. I think that it is interesting because it makes the idea of something which has a kind of fil rouge, but which is... Uh, continuously changing uh, because uh, of uh, daily activity of each of ours. Thank you so much. And then do you want to ask the last question and then we will uh, wrap up? Yeah, um, I mean, just reflecting on all of the talks, um, I wonder if, you know, uh, I, I maybe categorize ourselves as the folks working for sustainability or maybe people who are in general supportive of farm to fork um and seeing some of the other practices used by you know the large companies uh corporate capture the power imbalances etc are we playing too fair i know it's a sort of controversial question but are we playing too fair you know this notion of democratization on social media but then you see that it's i mean heavily commercialized um and you know are the voices really representative of the voices or is it some sort of algorithm uh, that's using our cookies to try to sell us stuff all the time. Uh, and then we on our side are trying to play as fair as possible and as open as possible, whereas the folks on the other side are definitely not playing the same game. And um, it's sort of a slippery slope. Uh, I don't know what the answer to this would be, but I find it quite controversial because I don't think um, uh, they are playing fair at all. Uh, and we are trying to play fair. Uh, but it means that um, 
you know, we're we're putting the health of the planet and people at risk. So I don't know if, again, no answers to that question. It's more just kind of rambling reflections. <laughs> if you guys have any thoughts on this. No, me neither. That's a good uh, point to end the, uh, the discussion. Okay, so I think that we'll, uh, we almost ran out of time. So thank you so much, uh, Lorenzo, for the presentation. It was a great, a great conclusion to the, to the webinar. And I also thank you so much, uh, everyone, for your, for your participation. We are still 70 people. And I think that after two hours and a half, it's, uh, it's also a, an accomplishment. And I think, and I really hope that uh, what we started and this aspect of that we try to stimulate the, the thinking about the around this uh, this aspect really really got the um, the point and the attention that it it uh, it needed and our goal really here was to, to summarize a little bit it's really we use the analogy in our discussion of, of a stone and a play-doh so i think that in in terms of policy really too often in food cultures have been used as a stone it's something external that cannot change or that could, it's it is like that and must be respected for what it is and instead we can see it more and more and from the previous presentation as well it's something that has historically changed that it has it has uh, also influence in social media in other aspects and there's also consequences on the on the on the law and how we perceive the laws as well and so it goes back to this sort of almost really general uh, really general question as well up to the point that towards the end we were almost discussing if there is any free will in this world so almost to the to the most philosophical question there is uh, there is out, out there and so we we hope that uh, that this was uh, was useful. And uh, if you have any question, any follow up, you you have my email in the in the agenda. You can you can send to me any any question. We can remain in touch. And of course, as I mentioned in the in the agenda of the event, it's this is such a broad topic that we will need to have a, a series of webinars just on this. But of course, in two hours and a half, we just try to give a broad overview, thanks to our aspect of why we think this is a really important and it could really uh, be um, a useful point for all of us, in, especially in the in the policy area, in the academic, and also I hope that uh, the bridge I talk about in the in the presentation about the research and the policy making is a little bit clearer also in this um, in this part. So I thank you so much, and I know Ananto or uh, some of the others if they want to give a final uh, final word. We'll give final word to Sofia. Uh, I would just say be on the lookout because we'll, um, Samuele and Sofia and the team are, are going to be creating policy briefings on this. Uh, Gastronationalism is one of the topics for uh, Feast, so uh, please do be on the lookout. So uh, with that, thanks thanks very much. And Sofia, last, last word to you. Well, thank you. Uh, yeah, I wanted to thank uh, the speakers to elaborate uh, on food culture, how it develops, how it really uh, affects our food behavior i think that uh it was it was great uh, and i think that hopefully the the audience also got a better understanding on on the influence of food culture and yeah i would like to to thank you